Wow, that was a great little video clip, right? <laughs> I wish it wasn't so relevant. But now that we all know what Thanksgiving is supposed to look like, right? Not, not according to what that looked like. So we can all do our best. Hey, welcome to Believer's Church. We're just so grateful that all of you guys are here this morning. If we can take that echo out, that would be incredibly awesome. Um, hey, listen, if this is by chance your first time here, we just wanted to say welcome. We're so incredibly happy that you are here. And um, for all of those who are watching online, uh, we just wanted to tell them welcome as well. And we're grateful that you've been participating with us and watching us. And it's been so fun interacting with all of the people online. Have you guys had an opportunity to see some of the comments after service sometimes that are being made? It's a lot of fun. So if you have the opportunity to do that, we encourage you to do that because we have a very large online audience. So here in the Jerome Church, we get to be a part of that online audience. That means that you guys and all of your interactions and gets to be a part of it too. So thank you, of course, for being here this morning. Pastor Clay is not with us this morning, but he will be next week, so we're super happy about that. And one more thing, if by chance you are watching online and you want to come to the service, please come anytime in Jerome at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings and at 10.30 a.m. in Twin Falls. We are a church now in three locations. We have Jerome online and Twin Falls. So guys, give God a hand clap this morning. God is doing some great things. And you know what? He's doing it with all of you. Robbie, can we get that echo out? Is it echo to you guys or is it just me? It's just me. All right. Pretty awesome. Okay, listen, how many of you guys enjoyed Pastor Allen last week all the way from LaPorte, Texas, right? That was pretty fun. If you guys were not here, I encourage you to go online and watch it from last week. He is our pastor from Texas and him and his wife, Michelle, and we just enjoy them so much. We had the opportunity to spend several days with them, and you might ask, well, what exactly does that look like? Do you guys just go out and party the whole time? Not really. Basically, they come over, and we have really deep discussions, and it's just a great time of refreshment for us and also for them. So always a great big thanks to all of you guys who help us host them as well. And so last week when he was here, he talked on a message. Do you guys remember the title of that message? It was something in reference to being grateful and not hateful. That's right. So we enjoyed that message so much that we wanted to tag onto that message. And some of you might've been here and so you may have heard the story that he opened up with. And it was of a young girl, a teenage girl, and she received something from her dad, something that she'd been hoping for, probably not something that she had been praying for, right? But she'd been hoping for. And so she walks out of the front door of her house. Her dad is really excited. And lo and behold, he has a set of keys and he's very excited to give her the set of keys. But as she walks out, she looks at the keys and then she looks beyond what is behind what they were the keys were and she sees this beautiful red Lamborghini right wow can you believe that can you even imagine that I can't even imagine that but my point is this is that when she saw that she was highly disappointed it just wasn't good enough for her why because it was an older model and it wasn't the color that she wanted it wasn't the interior color that she wanted on top of that and so he used that as an example of the today's day and age in which we live a lot of times God is presenting us with things but it's not according to our liking it's not exactly the way we thought that it was going to be right and instead of having a grateful heart many times we have what can turn into a hateful heart and so that's what we're going to study today. And um, he asked a question, Pastor Allen did uh, last week, and I kind of wrote this down. One of the questions he said he asked during the sermon that really hit home for a lot of us, how do you respond when you don't receive what you want? And just really let that settle in, because if you consider this message in reference to the day and age, even when it talks about the state of America, the state of the world, the state of our politics, how do you respond when you don't get what you want. Now, last night, I, um, I took myself out for just a few moments, just like for an hour. I thought, you know, I'm going to go out on a drive because it's what I wanted to do, right? And so I got in my car and I adjusted my temperature to the exact temperature that I wanted, right? I went up and down the roads way out here in the country because uh, my destination was I, I wanted to just take a few moments really quick to watch the sunset at a beautiful location. So I took the roads that I wanted, right? And then I finally found a place where I could pull over to where I can watch the sunset across a beautiful portion of the valley and also the canyon. And so I pulled into the parking lot that I wanted to park into. And as my seating was right, because I had the seat warmer on, I, I adjusted my radio station to the songs that I wanted to hear, right? All of these things were according to what Heather wanted. And it should have been a perfect opportunity for me to just bask in the presence of the Lord and really get my heart and my, light, my eyes and focused upon him. But you know what happened? A car drove up behind me, right? So all of this effort 
that I took in my life to do exactly what I wanted, I allowed a car to come up behind me. And guess what happened? He ruined it. He ruined everything, Ginger. He ruined my song for the moment. He ruined my sunset. He ruined the opportunity that I had going around all of those loops and those curves. And I allowed something as simple as another vehicle in my presence to ruin my moment with the Lord. And I began to think to myself, boy, that illustration that Pastor Allen gave kind of aligns a lot of times with me. In fact, I began to think about it something like this. How many decisions do we make every single day according to what we want? You'd be surprised when you start writing it down, when you start thinking about it, what, from everything, what you're going to wear, the temperature you're in your home, the kind of car that you're going to drive, the type of people that you're going to hang around, everything in you screams, I want, I want. And many times when you don't get it, then you, in a way, you throw a, tenter tam, a, tenter, a temper tram, tantrum. Boy, that's a hard word to say through. Temper tantrum. I've been out of that stage for a while. You know, a lot of times there's a consequence to our actions, and sometimes we don't want to think about that consequence. We don't want to think about if we don't get what we want, what might happen in response to it. And this is the story what I want to bring across to you guys to this today, and that is the story of Jonah. You know, when we think of Jonah, it's a story that all of us have heard since we were little children. It's a, it's a story that I love to, to tell my kids. It's, it's very colorful. It involves a great big fish. And if you have your Bibles with you, in fact, today you can open up to Jonah, the, the book of Jonah, chapter 3. And this is where we're going to start off. And when I think of Jonah, a lot of us think about the disappointment that Jonah became in life because he did not follow God's commands. But one thing I'd never really truly lined up with Jonah was his anger problem. You know, I think I've taught on how he was disobedient and how God had called him to go out and to minister the gospel of Jesus. Well, not of Jesus, but to minister God's good news, right? And he gave him an assignment, and, and Jonah fled the opposite direction. And in fact, when we were in Israel a few years ago, we got to go to Joppa, which is where Jonah had, had been for a while. And we saw that when God told him to go to Nineveh, he went the opposite direction. And not just a little bit of an opposite direction, like the complete opposite direction. Like he wanted to be out of the presence of God. I don't know how many of you guys can relate with that. When God asks you to do something, you know, sometimes we're excited about what God asks us to do. And other times, that's not quite the way we had anticipated it in our life. But God, I'll do this, but I'll only go so far. God, if you ask me to go over this desire or over this, uh, this line that I've drawn for myself in the sand, this is where I draw the line, God, and this is out of my comfort zone. You know, while we were there in um, Israel, we got to go to a place that, uh, that was pretty, uh, pretty radical to go to, not in a good way, but in an actually very frightening way. When one of our uh, people that we're with, he said, we want to take you to the Gaza Strip. And when I'm reading the story of Jonah, my mind immediately goes to a place because I was asked in my heart, like, okay, if God asked you to go somewhere where you absolutely do not want to go, I began to think of the most terrifying place where I've ever been or where God could possibly ever call me to go. And I remember when we were there, they said, hey, we're gonna go to the Gaza Strip, and so I did what everybody does, right? Like, I knew what the Gaza Strip was according to the news, and what we had been seeing, and all of the pictures of destruction and violence, and, and I knew immediately was a place that I didn't wanna go, but at the same time, I was curious enough to experience at least from a distance away. And so in my heart, if God had said, Heather, I want you to go and preach the gospel to the Gaza people, I think I would probably have hesitated in my heart as well. I think I would have thought twice and thought, I, you know, God, I'll do anything you ask me to do, but to go to that place, that place is bordered up. It's, an, it's a little area of land that has extreme borders all around it. It is considered a, a prison to most people. What is what we would consider even worse than a prison today. You cannot get in without a great deal of effort and to most of them, the majority of people, they can never get out. Because of all of the bombs and the rockets that have been uh, thrown in their direction, there's great poverty there. There's great destruction. All of the ruins, all of the blown up buildings. We've seen these images in our heart and mind. And when I even went to Wikipedia to type it in, they said, do not go to this place that is filled with violence. And it's very difficult for you to even cross over to the border without a lot of effort. But I remember the people saying, no, we're going to go visit and we're going to pray. 
And so as we were on our way, and, 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 and you know, we were still a distance away, but where they took us to this open field where we were even encouraged not to go. You know, I remember being in that open field, and at the time, Xander was a good two or three years younger than what he even is today, so he was only 10 years old. And I remember as a kid, you know, he's dancing around, and he's running up and down the dirt roads, and we're in this open field, and, and we can kind of see Gaza in a distance because between is what is considered the Israel land, and it looks like a beautiful, almost like a meadow right? So incredibly beautiful. So, so peaceful. I, I remember seeing the flowers that in bloom, but off in the distance, I could see the ruins. I could see the walls. I could see in a sense, the prison gates. I could see the people that were held in captivity. I could see the poverty. I could see the destruction. I could see the abuse. Cause if you're a woman in here, you've seen all of the images of how they abuse their women. I began to read the articles on what is really taking place beyond those borders. And my heart began to faint. I began to grow fearful as I should and afraid and to pray for those people even more than I ever have. But would have I have asked answered the call of God just like Jonah or would have I have answered it like a mighty woman of God honestly in that moment I don't know I think I could probably relate with Jonah a little bit more than I could the Heather Ramirez who stands on American soil today who can preach it live in it is a whole nother ball game and I began to put myself in Jonah's shoes as he began to tell God, no, God, I'm not going to do it. In fact, I'm going to flee as far away from you as I can because I don't want to go to the Assyrians. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go to that to those people who are destructive. I don't want to go to those people who serve pagan gods. I don't want to be on their team. I don't want to like that party. I don't want to pray for those people. Their belief system does not line up with mine. In fact, instead of being grateful for them, God, I want to be hateful for them. And, you know, that's where we are in America today. Somehow or another, we have been put on a team, whether you wanted to be put on a team or not. And you've realized that you have grown without even knowing it, a hatefulness for a people that God has called us to love. For a people that God has called us to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to. To a people that God has called not only his son, but us in his flesh and bone to carry out the very hand and the love of Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times when we think of sports, we think of the referee or we think of the umpire. And, and, you know, a lot of times those are either the most liked person on the field or the least liked person on the field, right? Any parents out there, right? When it's in your favor and he's rooting for your team, that umpire gets five stars. But boy, the minute he calls a call that you did not agree with, what do the people in the stands do? They begin to disagree. They begin to yell. They begin to say violent things. I was at a basketball game just two weekends ago with my son let me put this in a perspective he's in seventh grade he's just in a little club little club not even a school and a basketball team and I was sitting beside a man and he I, I, I think it was his daughter who was out on I, I, it was either his son or his daughter forgive me I don't mean that irresponsibly at all and he began to yell and say hey uh, I think her, Sam was her name hey Sam we all know that that referee made just a really bad call over the entire gym and no one else was talking because we were all masked up, right? And I just remember looking at him and thinking, that referee that you're talking about is a young teenager. And you know, this is a big man just rooting and I understand rooting for the positive side, but a lot of times we get upset when that referee or that umpire, whoever, whatever game you're in, when they aren't aligning up with your thoughts and your vision, when you don't get things done your way, all of a sudden the venom just begins to come out of us. And I think a lot of times in life, we think of God that way. We're like, you know what, God, when you're on my team, I'm in alignment with you. Everything is great. I'll serve you. I'll worship you when I need to. You know, because we feel like God is on our team. Can I tell you something right now? God's on everybody's team. He is. He loves all people. He loves all races. He loves all nations. And God is calling us to go into all nations, right? Ultimately, when we have the attitude that says, God, you're not good enough for me. That Lamborghini wasn't my color. You know, the interior wasn't what I had asked for. The year of the make and the model, we're basically telling God, our dad, that he's not good enough. We're telling them he, that his provision isn't enough. It's not what we wanted. It's not supposed to be this way. It's not what I bargained for. It's not what I prepared for. It's not even what I prayed for. Does any of that sound familiar? 
But God, it's not supposed to be this way. My marriage isn't supposed to be this way. I put money into savings. It was supposed to be making me money by now. I'm supposed to be making money work for me, not against me, right? I've done everything right, God. You know, as a pastor, I've heard that from so many people. I did everything right. I remember one woman who, who went through a terrible divorce, and she kept saying to me, Heather, I did everything right. I went to a Christian college. I married a Christian man, but were you faithful to God? No. Were you faithful to the house of God? Were you faithful to the people of God? Were you faithful to the command of God? And guess what? Even sometimes in all of that, a, a curveball still gets thrown. But is God still enough for you? You know that song that we sang just a moment ago, God, you're so good. Can I tag on a little bit for you? When you're on my team, God, you're so good. When I'm feeling good, God, you're so good. When my marriage is on the rocks, God, you're so good. When I feel like, you know, you're doing great things for me, when you're on my team, when you're in my favor, that's not how God works, church. God is good all the time, regardless of our circumstances around us, regardless. You know, when you're going through hard times in your life, and trust me, we all do. Just recently, I had some thoughts going through my mind, but you know what I rejoiced in because the circumstance was dark, it was depressing, it was overwhelming, but then I began to laugh. You know why? Because even though it's dark and it's depressing and it's discouraging, it can't stay on me because ultimately I know who I am. And I just began to laugh. I began to laugh out loud because I thought, you know what? I can count up all the things that are wrong in my life. I can count up all the areas where I feel like God has disappointed me. But the reality is this. It doesn't matter because I know who I am in God. I know that I am loved by a Savior. I know that with him all things are possible. I know that I'm more than an overcomer. I know that I don't have to stay in a state of depression. I know that things may not line up to the way that I feel that they should, but I know with God and his timing, all things will work out for good. Amen? Give God a hand clap for that. God is so good. We need to practice being grateful. Ungratefulness leads to hatefulness. And that's a super powerful word. Ungratefulness leads to hatefulness. Just as I was speaking of sports earlier, and this is the one thing that I do enjoy about sports, is you have to get up, you have to give it your all, you have to train yourself, you have to discipline yourself, and you have to be challenged. Those are some really great things that we can begin to apply in our lives. When you find yourself so angry and so disappointed and so depressed because the world isn't lining up to your particular views, then you have to practice being grateful even when you don't want to. Even when you don't agree with your spouse, you have to discipline yourself to line it up with the word of God. You need to put yourself in challenging circumstances where you make yourself be grateful. Because if you don't, I promise you this, your ungratefulness will turn to hatefulness. And that's a very dangerous place to be. God had already told Jonah to go to Nineveh and deliver a message. He had already disobeyed. Jonah at this point had already disobeyed. And he went to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. Basically, he didn't want to go. He did not want to go. He had some pretty reasons not to go because Nineveh was his enemy, right? How many of us have enemies in our life? Politics, man, we can get on that subject, can go round and round and round because we've created enemies over politics. They were a stubborn and a brutal people. Speaking of the people in Nineveh, they were not on Jonah's team. They were not a part of his political party. And I gave the example of my example, and I want you to think of what is your most destructive place that you can possibly think of, the, most, the place where it might be the most terrifying for you to line up with. In Jonah 3.1, I want to read this out loud. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. So this was after Jonah had already disobeyed God. It's after he had already uh, tried to escape. It was after the people on the ship threw him over because they knew he was a God-fearing man. All the winds and the waves and the destruction was coming before him. It was already, this, at this point, it's already when he was swallowed by a great fish and he was in the belly of the fish when he began to pray the prayer of Jonah. It was at this time that three days later his heart became repentant to God and he began to give his heart again unto the Lord. But this is what happened. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. God did not change his mind. Church, if God told you to do something the first time, it still stands. God isn't going to say, I used to be taught this. If, if you don't rise up and do what God called you to do, he'll re 
raise someone up, someone else up to do it. And I get that to a degree, but this is the, this is the truth, folks. God called you to do something. And the people that you can reach for the glory of God is not somebody that I can reach. You have a different power, a different anointing, a different favor, and I can preach until the moon doesn't shine. But that person will never receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior or even their friend and their deliverer unless you tell them. You can spend, send the best of the best preachers. I'll tell you, I have been ministering to this one particular family for over 16 years. And I'm telling you, in my home, at hours upon hours, at their house, at my house, ministering the love of God, using every scripture that I possibly can. And this particular family that is, that is close to my heart still has yet to receive Jesus Christ, still has yet to line up their lives with the gospel, still has yet to see the mighty call of God that God has upon their life. I'm telling you, I'll never stop preaching the love of God to them, but I'm telling you right now, I believe that someone else is called to preach that anointed word because I have done nearly everything that I possibly know how to do and there is still a wall. There's love, there's kindness, there's friendship, there's fellowship, there's a lot of enjoyment, a lot of laughter, but when it comes to the blood, there is no blood. Church, I am at wit's end when it comes to this particular family and all I can think of is that God has called someone to minister the love of God to them. I can preach until I have nothing left in me to preach anymore, but it's requiring the person that God said go to, the, to their Nineveh. I want to encourage you with this this morning. God is calling you to minister to someone, whether it be by phone, whether it be in person, whether it be in any other way of mode of communication. God is the one who is good calling you to be the deliverer, just like God is calling Jonah and it says to this it says he called him a second time get up to the great go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message that I have given to you this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh a city so large that it took three days to see it all on the day that Jonah entered into the city he shouted to the crowds 40 days from now Nineveh will be destroyed the people of Nineveh believed God's message right that to me just jumped off the page because of the illustration that i just gave you robbie they believed his message if they would just believe my message that god is good if they would just believe my message that god's salvation is for all if they just believe my message that god's ways are higher than their ways if they would just believe and yet here he goes to nineveh and he begins to minister god's message he said look if you guys don't come to know god he's going to destroy this place in 40 days in a way i've been preaching to these families look if you don't line your up with the word of God if you don't receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior there is an eternity in hell that God talks about and then some of these people like I said you can preach until the moon doesn't shine but unless they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior they will never know God's goodness and his gratefulness and his forgiveness and yet here we go back to Jonah and his heart wasn't even right in this but he was obedient for the moment and as, as he went and he began to preach they believed I want that kind of anointing i want that part of Joe and jonah's anointing that when i begin to speak the love of god the people come and they flock and they begin to understand and not only did they believe they did something with their belief this time jonah obeyed the lord's command and went and they believed the people of Nineveh believed god's message and from there from the greatest to the least they declared a fast and they put on burlap to show their sorrow when the king of nineveh heard that jo what jonah was saying he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal clothes he dressed himself in burlap and sat on the heap of ashes even the king believed what Jonah's message was speaking then the king and his noble sent this decree throughout the city no one not even the animals we herds or flocks may eat or drink anything at all people and animals alike must wear the garments of mourning and everyone must pray seemingly earnestly to God they must turn from their evil ways and stop their violence who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that was threatened. This, chapter 4, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. Does anybody feel like that's just a little bit ironic here? If you go back up to verse 10 of the previous chapter when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to all of their evil ways, God changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction. Because they had stopped, because they had repented, because they had come to know God through Jonah. And you know who was upset about it? Jonah. Jonah was upset. 
that their hearts were turning and beginning to serve God. Jonah doesn't obey, and he goes the opposite direction again with his attitude. He is critical, and he does not want God to be favorable to Jonah's enemy. I'll tell you what, church, it's a dangerous place and a dangerous game that we begin to play with people when we say that God is good to those, that he'll never be good to you. It's a place of judgment where you never want to be. When you begin to elevate yourself and say, God will bless me, but not someone like you. That's a dangerous game to play because God is a just God. He abounds in grace and mercy for everyone. You know, one thing that I love about my brother, he's here with us this morning. Robbie, you guys know him, him and his wife, they travel as a part of our missionary team. It is good to go to other nations. It is good to get out of your community. It is good to see what other people go through. It's good to see what other people rejoice in. The little things, and it brings a whole new perspective to our a lot of things. It is good because God's grace and his mercy is for all. It's for all nations. It's for all people. And we are no better than anyone else. God is a humbling God. He loves everyone and doesn't want one person to perish. Second Peter three, nine says this, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. You know, I hear it say, I'm just ready for Jesus to come. Are you? Have you done all that you can do to reach out to the masses? Have you done all that you can do to reach out to the one? Have you displayed love, God's love and his kindness, his abundant mercy to all? Are you really ready for God to come? Are you really ready for the rapture and for those people to be lost? I want you to question your heart today. Do you really love God? Because if you did, if I did, this is not a condemning message to you. If we did, we would doing, be doing more with the love that God has placed in our hearts for other people, of all people. Of all people, we believe God. When we believe God is on our team, we expect him to make favorable calls for us and not the other team because they are our enemy. Do you have an enemy this morning? Do you have an enemy in your heart? Do you consider yourself your enemy? God wants you to evaluate your heart today. Enemy, the description of the word enemy is it's a person who feels hatred for, fosters harmful designs against, or engages in antinoxic activities against another, an adversary or an opponent. That's the definition of what an enemy is. It's one who threatens our life and the way we live it. Ooh, that'll preach. When we feel threatened that you're going to ruin my life, that you're going to make me change to line up with something that I don't want to. The Assyrians were popular, polar opposites to the Jews politically, culturally, and religiously. They were a violent, pagan people. I think like Jonah, we have intentionally or unintentionally moved into teams or sides in our life. And we need to reevaluate our heart. That God is not coming back for a party. He's coming back for a people. His people. Jonah, instead of being grateful that the Assyrians are turning to God, he is angry about God's judgment call on them. I think that's a lot of people that we see right now. I'm angry about God's call on the field of life, and it seems like he favors the other side. So we throw a temper tantrum because things didn't go quite the way we had expected them to go. If you go on down to Jonah 4, verse 2, he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say, this is Jonah speaking to God, didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? I mean, I don't know if I've ever talked to God like that, right? Because if I talked to my dad like that, there'd be a switch on my behind. I don't care how old I am. And he said, God, didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? That is why I ran to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and a compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. And he was not, here, let me change that in case you guys ever receive a text from someone like that. Let me just, let me do this. 
So, God, didn't I say this before before I left home that you would do this? That's why I ran to Tarshish. I knew that you were merciful and compassionate. That's not what Jonah was saying. Be careful how you read your texts. He was yelling at God. He was upset at God. God, didn't I tell you before I left? That's why I left in the first place. You gave me a red car instead of a white car. You gave me tan interior instead of black. Didn't you listen to what I told you? This is my Christmas list. And you've not listened to a thing I've said. I already told you not what not to do. And that's what we do to our God. God, you're not voting the way that you should be voting. You're not doing things the way. Don't you know what those people do over there? They deserve death. They deserve fire. They deserve eternity in hell. That's what a lot of people are saying. And God says, but I am a gracious God. I am filled with love. I am filled with compassion. And I have more than enough. But what is scary is this, is when God cannot convince us to change our own heart. That's what's scary. But God, you don't know what he did to me. You don't know the words that they spoke over me. You don't know how they violated me. You don't know how they came in to my territory when I told them not to. You don't know how they uh, uh, took everything away from me. God says, I know all things. And if you trust me, I can work all things together for good. But it is a scary place when God cannot convince us to change our own hearts. Jonah is in a place where God is pouring out the blessings upon an entire region. And he's upset about it. If you go on, I'll paraphrase from here. Jonah is so upset that he begins to throw his pity party. Does anybody remember where he goes and what he does? He goes out of the city where he can see down. And what does God do? He provided a place for him, even in the midst of his sorrow, even in the midst of his sin. It was sin. And God had a tree prepared for him in that hot desert. And he goes up there and he still has a judgmental heart. And then the next day, God has such a great sense of humor. He created a worm to go. And what did that worm do? He ate through that tree to where it was destroyed and fell. And he said, Jonah, do you have any right to even appreciate what I have provided for you that you did not pay for? You did not plant that tree. I was the one who gave you the provision and it's still not good enough. Do you see your heart, Jonah? God is giving him a second chance, but Jonah is so filled with hate and hate is powerful. Church, hate is powerful and not in a good way. Hate changes our heart and our perspective. Hateful people complain. Mm, let's just let that sit for a second. Are you complaining? Because that's not what spirit-filled believers should be doing. It's not what people who are walking in the joy of the Lord, that's not what they do. Hateful people complain. If you just justify all of your complaints, well, I deserve to complain. People need to know my opinion. Do they? Because this says that hateful people are the ones who complain. We want a move of God, but we want him to do it in our way. Where there is... A clear loser and we are a clear winner. But God doesn't want one person to perish. Isn't that so good? God doesn't do things according to our standards. Aren't you glad about that? Because I'd be wrong. I'd been wrong all the way to my freshman year when I was praying to Jesus that I'd get married to some other man. Thank God. That, you know, thank God, God doesn't answer all of your prayers. Anybody else ever have that prayer, right? Only three other people in this prayer is a freshman or a high school student. God, let me marry that person. No. Yeah, that, thank God. Yeah, I know that person to this day. Thank God. I did not marry that. <laughs> Scary. But God loves them. And I love them. No hate in my heart. And I'm not complaining. Just saying. Scripture does not show us. I am rejoicing. This is a very rejoiced tether. Hallelujah. Scripture does not show us what happened to Jonah. My hope is that his heart turned around. But the question is this. Can God be speaking to us in our prayers and in church and we are still refusing to change? Is God speaking to your heart today 
to where even when God blesses you, you can't see it. I can't help, in, in my mind, my mind is going there, when I think I can parallel this to the story of the prodigal son. When that lost son comes back and the dad of the home says, go get the fatted cow and kill it. Go get the robe, go get this, the ring to identify that he truly is my son. You know, who, who was the one who was angry? Who was the one who didn't disobey? It was the son. It was the other son. It was the brother. The other brother who said, I've done everything right, dad. I've never disobeyed you. I've stayed here. I ran the ranch while he was gone, throwing away all of the money, you know, going out and partying and doing all that. And all of this hate in the prodigal son's brother began to just surface. And he couldn't even bless his own brother who had came back into the fold of his own father. Hate is a dangerous thing. And God wants us to get that hate, reveal it, expose it, and take care of it. Jonah 4.4 4 says this, the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? That's God asking Jonah. So let me just say this this morning to you. Is it right for you to be angry about this? Is it right that things aren't going your way? Oh, that coin can flip on both sides. God can be speaking to the other person too. Is it right that you're upset that they haven't let you who has done evil to hurt them? Don't think for just a moment that you're going to get away with doing evil to other people. Don't think that this is a message where I'm preaching where it's okay for them to abuse you. Because I'm not. This is not a message justifying abuse, anger, harm, distrust. God's judgment is for all and God's freedom is for all. And there is a balance. And when you begin to think, oh, this message is for so-and-so. It's not for me. That's when God's saying, get the mirror, my love, and turn it around because God should be speaking to you on how you line up your heart to be set free from the anger that you've had because they didn't do the things that you wanted them to do. It, that coin goes both ways. Angry. This is what the Lord said. He replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Our attitude reveals our faith. When I am reactive and critical to the call that God has made, it reveals my faith or the lack of it. God loves our enemies, but he doesn't want them to stay our enemies. And sometimes that person who is the enemy, they need to change their hearts too. They need to change their ways. That doesn't mean that they get to manipulate you. It doesn't mean that they get to control you. It doesn't mean that they get to walk all over you. God says, you change your heart and allow him and he'll do the rest. There is a special anointing for people who have been abused. I'm talking about physically, verbally, emotionally, manipulatively. There is an anointing that you can tap into from God that never has to justify what that person did to you. He's not asking you to stoop down to that level. He's asking you to get your own heart freed and set free. Amen. You know, I want to say this when it, in reference to, um, the day and age that we live in right now, that God's not a particular party. We need to remember this as tempted as we are to go to one side or the other. And I believe believing God for things that I'm still standing in faith for and in reference to our country, I'm not going to, I'm not going to not stop believing and standing and trusting but I have to remind myself of this. I am not a citizen of this world. I am not even a citizen of the United States of America. I'm a citizen of heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. And I can't afford creating enemies over a particular season of life that we're in. When God says he has called us to love all and to represent him Give him as a representation to all. So how can we change? I'm going to give you four quick ways to change. Number one, be honest about ourselves and evaluate the hate. <laughs> Not the hate in someone else's life. God's asking you to evaluate the hate that you have in your own. What have I done that has stirred up hate in my heart that might be pinpointing it in someone else's and causing them to have a reaction against me? Because most people won't hate you unless you've done something to them. So the question is this, be honest about myself and I want to evaluate my hate. Why do I hate someone else who is prospering? Why do I hate someone else who is suffering? I mean, Jonah had both. He was hating a country that was suffering. 
that's a hard place to be. Jonah 4.11 says, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? That's God saying, look, if I have a heart for people like that, then you should have a heart for people like that. In my, in my small little experience of going to the Gaza Strip where I was pretty much almost terrified. I mean, I was around good people, so I wasn't that scared. But do I have that kind of love for them? Would I be willing, you know, to go in and administer the love of God to them? Now, listen, if God directly told me, like, I would obviously do that. There, there's a big, vast, you know, land mass and ocean mass between us. But yeah, you know, I would. I absolutely would. If God told me to go into a region where ladies were being raped and destroyed and manipulated and ultimate, ultimate destruction and poverty and depression, you bet I would. Would you do that for your neighbor? Would you do that for the people that God, you know, when I was driving last night, take this as a grain of salt because I mean it. I was asking the Lord some questions because as I was driving out in the country, I was just real open with the Lord. And I said, God, why? Why did you put us here? You know, um, laugh with me. And I hope you know my personality well enough to know this. Just a bunch of cows everywhere. Lots and lots of dairies. And, and I'm like, and I'm in my car and I got a lot of thinking going on. And I'm like, really, God? I'm not complaining. I just said, really, God? Like, what were you thinking? Like, what, what am I not lining up? What, what am I? Because this is the next word. Because when we began the ministry here, I kind of envisioned that all of those people, you just, in your mind, you're thinking, I'm coming and we're bringing the gospel. We're bringing the love. We're bringing the joy. We're bringing the hope. We're bringing the word. We're bringing the answer. They're just going to come in and we're going to, you know, we're going to have a Nineveh moment. They're all going to believe. And I'm driving around. I'm like, I don't know any of these people. I didn't know but two of the homes, you know, and I thought, man, I, I didn't have my phone on me. I thought, man, if I got in a, in a pickle, I'd have nobody to run to, you know, like, I don't know any of these people like, really God, what were you thinking? Like, why did you put clay and I here? You know, like not, not in a doubtful way, but in a questioning way, like, is there something that I'm missing? And maybe you need to ask God that too. God, you placed me here. Why? What am I missing? What am I not doing? What am I doing? You know, it's good for us to hear some of those attaboys sometimes too. And allow God to be honest with your heart. Number two, repent. Second Timothy 2.25 says this. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. If for any reason, it's for that reason alone. When you repent and you ask God and you begin to question him, God, am I leading people to the knowledge of the truth? Am I leading them to come to their senses and to escape from the trap of the devil? Am I leading them, those who are in captivity, to a place of freedom? Those are the questions that you get to ask God. After you repent and say, God, if there's any harshness in me, if there's anything that was unkind, if there was anything that was not good, you take that away and can you reveal to me what my plan and my purpose is, what your plan and purpose is, is for my life again. Number three, you have to love your enemies. Matthew 5 43 says this, you have heard the law that it says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for them. And it, it doesn't mean get on Facebook and social media and start slanderizing them. Even if you're not aiming at a particular person, you're still aiming it at a particular person. And you know what you're doing. In that way, you will be acting as two children of God, your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the evil and the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike if you love only those who love you what reward is there for you in that the last one is this change hate into gratefulness colossians 3:15 says and let the peace that comes from christ rule in your hearts for as members of one body you are all called to live in peace and always be thankful we're just going to close on that with that being a beautiful ending of understanding God's gratefulness and his love. I want you to ponder these thoughts this week. 
God, has any of my ungratefulness turned into hatefulness? And if it has, I repent of it. If it has, God, I ask that you reveal it. If it has, Lord, I ask that you take it away. Can we place ourselves in a place of humility that literally says, God, I welcome you into my heart that, God, you'll help me to love the unlovely. You'll help me to love. Not that you have to go socialize with them and become their best friends, right? That's not what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that you drop your guard and that you have to go and accept everything that they've done to you in the past. When Jonah went to Nineveh, he did not become a Ninevite. That's a good word. He didn't become one of them. He was still an Israeli. He was on the Israel team and they were on a Nineveh team and he wanted God to do things the Israel way and God says, I'm on no team. I belong to no man. I belong to all people and all people belong to me. But that doesn't mean that he went and that he adapted the pagan ways. God, yes, is calling us to have a heart of gratefulness, a, call, a heart of thankfulness, and a heart of a warrior to go out and to minister the love of God. But that doesn't mean that you stoop yourself down and become one of them. I want to speak to the heart of a woman and a man because men can be abused too. If you have been abused in any of those ways that I've said, whether it be spiritually, mentally, physically, any other way. And girls, they can throw it out on those men's men just as much as a man can throw it out on a woman. I'm not asking you to go back to the vomit. I'm not asking you to go back to the pain. But I am asking you this this morning to forgive and to welcome God's goodness and to welcome his wholeness into your heart this morning. And you say, God, I see that you sent, Nina, or you sent Jonah to a place where he didn't want to go. That was a physical place. But God may be speaking to you this morning saying, I want you to go to a spiritual place. I need you to go into the depths of your heart, that place where you've dug so deep and you put walls so high. And you say, God, from this point on, I'm giving it to you. And I need to experience a freedom that no man and no woman could ever bring me. If that message is for you, I, I don't even want you to raise your hand. I just want you to open your heart. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. The second prayer that I want to pray over you is this this morning. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You know, I, I minister this a lot to people where I say a lot of people, they're good at receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. Like they understand that Jesus went to the cross, that he bled, that he died for them, that he took upon the weight of the world, that he took upon sin so that we wouldn't have to. A lot of times people understand that. It's a spiritual thing, but we're a spiritual body, so they get it. But the part that they don't understand is, is he your Lord? Salvation isn't the end, because we tend to think that, categorize that in our mind. Well, it's the end, it's our step to heaven. No, it's the beginning. It's the step to earth. Salvation means, God, now I'm making you the Lord of my life. That's where most people get it wrong. But I still want to hate. I still want to walk in bitterness. I still want to walk in my pleasuring sin. I still want to be spiteful. I still want to be lazy. I still want to be indulging in things that I shouldn't be indulging in. I still want to be a backbiter. I still want to hold bitterness against people. I still want to be free to say what I want to say when you know you should shut up. That's understanding who the Lord is in your life. Lord, I don't want to be that way anymore. I'm going to practice. I'm going to discipline. I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to be like an athlete where I put it into play. And I'm not going to blame the referee anymore. I'm not going to blame the umpire when things don't go my way because I realize that God you're God. I don't control you with the statements that I make. I don't control you with the heartache that I have. I'm not going to run on some mountaintop and look down and place judgment on people that I have no point in judging. God, I'm going to turn it and look at me and say, where are the areas in my life where I need to change, where I need to grow, where I have been judgmental and I just didn't know? God, would you change my heart in that area this morning? And would you become the Lord? That means I'm going to read the word of God. And even though I don't understand it, or I don't even agree with it because it's not convenient. Look, guys, we're always tempted to think that our brains are smarter than God's. 
Like this is God's way. Mm, that was for yesterday, but God, I got this. If I need you, I'll let you know. That's what we sometimes do. I'll let you know if I need you, God, but I, I think I got it. I've got experience. I've got my knowledge. If I need you, I know where to get you. That's not, that's not Lord. That's not even a friend. That's a um, manipulative heart of control. It's using, it's abusive. If that's you this morning, you say, Lord, I need you, not just as my savior. I need you as my Lord. That's who I'm going to pray over this morning. Church, would you stand? Um, And I want you to pray this prayer. You don't need to follow my prayer. You can just pray to yourself as, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. But there is a lot of power when we have unity in prayer. So, Father, we just come to you this morning, and I pray the mighty hand of God. Thank you, Jesus, for the word of the Lord that was spoken this morning, that it fell upon ground that was willing and able and ready to receive, that can grow into a harvest that only you can give, to produce, to feed the multitudes. Father, I pray that if there has been abuse in here, God, I just pray that, God, there is forgiveness and that there is hope for a future. God, if I'm speaking today for the abuser, God, I ask I pray that they line their heart up with you this morning, that they repent. God, a true repentance, a sorrowful, I turn from that wicked way, I acknowledge it, and I ask you to forgive me, and I will never step into that again. I pray for those who are abusive, that no longer do they want that spirit of hatefulness and anger upon them. Father, I pray for those who have not received you as their Lord and their Savior, the God that they welcome you into their heart, they, they ask you to come in, that they repent of their sins, that they receive you as their Lord and their Savior. And the final prayer today is this, Lord. If there are people in this congregation or those who are listening online who have made you their Savior but who have yet to make you their Lord, I pray a very special prayer over them. They're going to need strength, God. They're going to need a new hope and a new trust that they've never tapped into before. God, would you give them grace and mercy, hope, love? And God, I just pray a special prayer. Would you give them support from another person to help them? And God, when that person comes into their heart, would you help them open their heart and their mind to be retrained, to trust in you instead of trusting in themselves? God, we give you the praise and the worship for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If you receive that this morning, church, say amen. Praise God. You may be seated as David comes out. He's going to close this session for us today. Hey, guys. If you're joining us online and looking for a way to support Believer's Church financially, we have four simple and secure ways that you can do that. As always, you can give online through our website at www.believerschurchidaho.com. As soon as you get to the homepage, click on the giving tab, and then the website will lead you through the rest of that process. Now, you can give one time by card, or you can enter your bank information for recurrent giving. Or if you're looking for a simpler mobile solution, just text the dollar amount you'd like to give to 84321. As soon as you do that, you're gonna get a text message back with a church center link. Go ahead and click on that link and it'll give you the option to select Believer's Church and complete your giving on your mobile device. Now, if you'd like to go straight to the church center source, feel free to download the church center app on the app store on your mobile device. Now this application will allow you to manage your giving, your contact information, and it'll give you access to the latest information about upcoming events. Now if none of these electronic options are appealing to you, you can always give through the mail by sending your correspondence to 100 East Avenue D, Jerome, Idaho, 83338. We want to thank all of you for your continued support, and we're absolutely honored that you've chosen Believer's Church as your medium to give back to God. Thanks again.